So I'm going to show you just a few pictures of different lesbian couples, and you're going to tell me what your initial reaction is when you see them, okay? Okay, bet. Couple one. Goals, that's how me and my baby about to be. Now, what about couple two? Okay, they cute or whatever. Low-key, both of them can get it. All right, and couple three. Um, I mean, like, that's gay. You know, like, uh, that's gay. You know, you know, they were all gay because they're all lesbian. Yeah, but it's different. They gay. Oh. Okay. Hello and good morning, Scullies. Welcome back to another episode of Toxic Mental Tuesday, where I talk about anything having to do with toxicity and or mental health. For those who don't know me, my name is Savon Pearson. I like to talk about anything having to do with the LGBT community, especially being a lesbian. And then I'm also super passionate about normalizing mental health. Now today we're gonna be a little bit more on the toxic side. Today we're gonna be discussing studs and the toxic masculinity that a lot of them kind of take on the traits of. Now for those who don't know, studs are masculine black women kind of similar to how the white lesbians have the term butch so butch is a white typically white masculine female and then stud is in the black community what we refer to masculine females now if you're a stud and you're watching and you feel like you don't have these traits cool I'm not saying all studs have this traits, but this is something that I have noticed and also the person that I will be referencing throughout the video, her article, she has also done research on and has noticed the same types of things. Now, just a little quick backstory to this video. I was supposed to actually do this video in June and discuss it with my friend Kyla that you have seen in the rules of dating and then the four rules of being a black lesbian video. So we were originally supposed to talk about this. However, I could not get my hands on this article in time. Thankfully, I reached out to the author of this article and she gave me the green light to discuss it on my channel and she gave it to me for the free free because y'all, it was not cheap. So this article is called Studs and Protest Hypermasculinity, the Tomboyish within the Black Lesbian Female Masculinity. So it's a lot, it's a mouthful. However, it was the studs and hypermasculinity that that did it for me. I was like, hmm, okay. So this article is written by Laura Lane Steele. Shout out to her for allowing me to use it and talk about this. She is actually um, from her Facebook because you know, I did a little light stalking. She is a, from what it seems, a masculine presenting white woman. And so she went and did a study in South Carolina, the South, essentially interviewing different masculine black lesbians and seeing the nuances of them and how it relates to their masculinity and how it relates to their relationships with men and then their relationships with themselves. Thursday I'm going to talk about my personal experience dating a masculine woman and just what about the masculine woman, the masculine stud that interests me and why I have more so of a preference to date masculine studs. But today we're going to get into the toxic masculinity that we see in the black studs. So there are five different sections to this discussion. Go ahead and utilize the timestamps. I have them there for a reason, just in case you want to skip around or just hear about a certain thing more. Section one will be about what is masculinity, and then I will be introducing the terms protest masculinity and then hypermasculinity. While section two will be about what makes a stud, what is the ideas behind it why do they choose to be masculine women the section three is going to be about studs and relationships also with their sex life so we're going to get a little bit into what that means then section four will be studs and males so we're going to be talking about their relationships together how they can typically end up being either one of the boys or something that is discriminated against so we'll get into the nuances of that and then finally section five will be about homophobia and what she calls homo masculinity so we got a lot to get through so go ahead and grab your coffee grab your snack grab your dinner your lunch and sit down and let's talk about it so i went old school i printed out the article and you know i was i always had points in class for being a great annotator so i annotated a lot because there was a lot of things i wanted to discuss with you guys so first of course we have to read her thesis statement look i'm bringing y'all back to school so she says I will show you how black female masculinity has been influenced by historically based constructions of black gender. Yes, she capitalized black, yes ma'am. 
More specifically, I will argue that these studs strategically construct and perform their masculinity in ways that shield them from sexism, racism, and homophobia, both in and out of their black community. So I think that's a pretty strong statement to make. And I really feel like, at least with the pool of studs that she interviewed, that she really hit it on the nail. So section one essentially will be what is this type of masculinity? You know, what is protest masculinity and what is hyper masculinity? What do these terms mean? So protest masculinity is a pattern of masculinity constructed in local working class settings, sometimes among ethnically marginalized men. So we got black men, any man of color essentially, which embodies the claim to power typical of regional hegemonic masculinities in Western countries. For example, in America, how white men are basically the standard. And so black men have to figure out what that standard is for black men because they won't be able to reach that standard of being a westernized white man which lacks the economic resources and institutional authority that underpins the regional and global pattern so basically they are set to fail period so hypermasculinity is taking certain characteristics of hegemonic masculinity and then in parentheses we have homophobia misogyny dominance and the policing of gender to more extreme levels. She provides a quote in here that I really um, think makes sense and it says it seizes upon opportunities for projecting male dominance, possibly functioning as a means to vent the extra frustrations that black men experience in a racist society while also shoring up a sense of identity in an uncertain social world. So I thought that statement was pretty powerful. So channel these things as we talk about these parts that the studs take on that black men have been forced to take on as well. So that takes us to section two. What is a stud? What makes a stud? Well, it's sort of like an embodiment of those terms or can be an embodiment of those terms, but put into the feminine form. So studs are typically characterized by their clothing, by their outer appearance. So it's like usually the way they dress and they usually dress in typical men's clothing. Um, I'll show a few pictures of different studs just so you can get the idea of what a stud is, but I think you guys know if you clicked on this video. And so they usually resemble the style of the average black man at the time. So basically the way men dress, put it on a woman and it looks damn good. So Laura interviewed a couple different studs, just asking them, what does being a stud mean to you? One stud is Jamie, who talks about it being more about clothing and the outward appearance, while the other one, Jasmine, says it's more about her mentality. So I'll read their different quotes so you can get an idea of what they mean. So Jamie said, I just feel more comfortable in men's clothing, being more masculine rather than being all girly girly, wearing skirts, heels, etc. So essentially just the way she dresses, she just feels more comfortable in clothing that is more suited for a male or in a society that tells you it's more suited for a male. However, Jasmine, on the other hand, talks about more so it being a mentality thing more than the outward appearance. She said, To me, stud is more based on your mentality than your clothes. She talked about essentially how it's kind of tied up in her role as being the breadwinner and the provider. So she said, I prefer to work and you have your income as supplement. That's our fun money, so to speak. And you know, I take care of the household, the bills, the things that need to be done. If you need to go to work, we only have one car, then I'm taking you to work, so. She's tying, kind of trying to take on the male role that we see in typical heterosexual relationships. But I think one of the biggest things to note is these women are not trying to be men. They don't want to be men. It's just more so they take on the masculine role. And I think it's important to note that masculinity is not tied to any gender. See, Stacy said to that, that you're always going to be a girl. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're always going to have some feminine parts in it. So there's still women. Take the clothes off. That's a woman. Mentality-wise, mind-wise, yes, they may want to have those traits of being the provider, etc. But they're still a woman. They still experience the same things that we experience. Jamie said, I don't want to be a boy. I just feel more comfortable playing the more masculine part. And so Laura ended up concluding that female masculinity embodied by these studs prove that biological sex is not a determinant or requirement of gender expression. Laura then references a woman who studies gender theory, Judith Butler, and she said that gender is performed, but this performativity is not necessarily voluntary or conscious. You know, it's just something that you naturally 
experience. Just like for me, I'm a natural nurturer. Um, maybe studs are more so just natural providers and that is typically seen in the masculine role. So section three is a lot more interesting. So basically I'm going to be talking about studs and relationships, what the roles is, and then essentially um, Laura made some interesting points that I think ring true as far as studs in their sex life. So what she found was typically studs always date femmes. You know, you see the stud, femme, and you see the, you could see femme femme, but you know, just like my intro, but stud stud, it's like, hmm, wait, that's wrong. So we're gonna get into some of these studs thoughts on that. Stud femme relationships follow many of the same scripts of normative heterosexual relationships. You know, they always ask, who's the boy, who's the girl in the relationship? And I'm just like, this is just me personally in my relationships. I just don't like traditional gender roles. There it is. I just I just don't like them at all. But studs, as she noted, usually calls themselves the boy in the relationship where I'm just y'all, y'all see I'm ugh, the boy. No, you my woman, you my wife. However, you're just more masculine. <laughs> Laura said many of them use extremely misogynistic languages referring to their girlfriend as my bitch, my hoe. To put it bluntly like, they just sound like dudes. Dudes always say, you know, that's my bitch, that's my hoe, that's my whatever. But not my stud, not who I date, sorry. Mm -mm, we not doing that. So one thing I thought was super interesting was that in their relationships, every other way they mirror the heterosexual standards except for in their sex life. So what she's referring to is that heterosexual sex is usually about the men reaching that pleasure, whereas stud sex is completely different where it's more so like they, the femmes, take precedent over the studs' needs. So she basically talked about that during sex, the femmes' sexual pleasure is prioritized over the studs. So it's all about pleasing the woman. Where Whereas in heterosexual relationships, now it's more so focused and geared towards what the men want. And that you see that in society, you see that in porn, you see it all the time. So she did note that some studs don't even like to be stimulated at all. So they don't want to be touched. You know, that's what you call the touch me nots. They don't they don't want to be touched at all. To each their own. If that's not what they want, you know, they give they get pleasure from giving and that's completely understandable. So she said while these studs masculinity still require dominance in the bedroom, they're expected to satisfy their partner with their sexual desires coming second or sometimes just not at all. And you know, I think it's interesting, maybe, I wonder if a lot of studs or studs at all could be on the A spectrum. Um, I think that would be an interesting nuance to explore because touch me nots, I just realized, you know, from my last couple of videos that that, that could just be somewhere on the asexual spectrum, but mm -mm, that's something to explore too. So now we're gonna get right into section four, which is studs and men. What's the relationship with them? What's the nuance? Like, what is it? So what I found and what she found as well was that it's kind of more so about being accepted in the black community or blending in. What she said was the embodiment of this masculinity can provide these studs with access to the power and privileges that come with masculinity. So essentially they get this access to male privilege that they might not have had being perceived as a woman. So basically what I'm trying to say is this access to male privilege, it kind of provides them a cloak against misogyny and all of the things that femmes get. And so essentially they just kind of provide this protection of not being seen as a woman and avoiding those types of negative traits that come with being a woman, which I think is super interesting because they are also misogynistic. So they can, they can dish it, but they can't take it is what I'm hearing. So like I said, Laura said that they're able to avoid much of misogyny directed at them by men. They avoid it, essentially. And so she said, furthermore, their misogyny towards femmes function as a way for them to assert dominance over subordinate groups. As humans, I've noticed that we just love being above someone because it gives us the sense of like, we are powerful, we have this power. Um, and I noticed it in the LGBT community, especially with TERFs, I will say like, you know, we're lesbians, but we don't like our, we don't like trans, trans lesbians. They're not, no, they're not like us. Um, and so it's interesting because TERFs, they really divide the LGBT community in general, because it's just like, we're supposed to be the accepting community when there's a lot of things that we, um, I've noticed as a community socially don't accept. She said, despite the certain protections that their masculinity grants them, they are still victims of homophobia by members of the black community and the larger culture, of course, the white community everywhere, everywhere, you know. So they can't avoid the misogyny that they would get from men or black men in general, but they can't avoid homophobia. And she also said in order to deflect some of these strong negative reactions, their stud femme relationships usually mirror heterosexual relationships because they're trying to be as normal as possible or what they think is normal, 
what society has told them is normal. Being in a romantic relationship that resembles what is accepted in mainstream culture may detract from potential criticism and even violence. Yeah, it's if you are essentially a little bit like what society wants to see you as, maybe they can, they, it's easier for them to, I don't wanna say control you, but it's just easier for them to digest you. In times like this, um, this was written in 2011, um, and I feel like we've also just come a long way since 2011 as well. And so it can get to the point where it's violent. It's, it's, it's something that is threatening your safety because people don't accept you for who you are or because people can't put you in the box that they, they want you to be in so that because they don't understand you. But it's not about other people and their understanding. It's just about the idea of them respecting you. So now that brings us to section five, our final section, which will be about homophobia and homo masculinity. So as she talked about before, one of the key traits of protest hypermasculinity is homophobia. So of course, some of these studs will take on that same homophobia. Usually the homophobia is directed towards stud on stud relationships, masculine masculine relationships. That is essentially what we call homo masculinity. And so so you've seen them take it out on stud for stud relationships but we also see it in black gay men and so i'll get into some of the interviews where i was kind of shocked to see that there was feminine um, or masculine women studs out there who really just don't accept gay men like that's just weird to them and so i think i have some theories on that but i'll get into it in just a second all right so another woman she interviewed wanda she wanda was not having it with gay um, male relationships at the end she said laura Laura in the butt. And another lesbian, Stacy, she was talking about how she just doesn't like the way men kiss. But what Laura noted is that it is disgust, not hatred. And so I think that was super interesting because usually people who are homophobic, it's more so of a hate thing and disgust. But for, for women, masculine women, for studs, it's more so of just a disgust. And I think, you know, I think that stems from lesbians. We don't socially typically um what i've seen is the majority we don't like men and so just the idea of there being two like <laughs> you know and so i think some of it stems from that um but also again the homo masculinity that she is talking about here so i'm gonna read this person kd's quote that laura interviewed she said that i don't think another dominant or stud woman should date another dominant or stud woman it just it just don't look right you know like but two femmes can be together but I prefer to see femme with another dominant or stud because you got to have a balance. It's just like in a heterosexual relationship, you got a male and a female because there's a balance as to how you handle situations, how you can handle the financial side, who's going to handle the financial side, who's going to handle the relationship, holding the relationship together. There has to be a balance. But if you got two studs, you got this equal, little like equal thing, you're going to have conflict. You know, that's what I think. Yeah, and, and I think that's just a common misconception that people have is, is that you need masculine and feminine energy for things to work, and you don't. You absolutely don't. Two femmes can be together, two masculine women to, can be together. And, you know, I think it's interesting. It goes back to the homo masculinity. You know, men can't accept gay men, lesbian studs can't accept to masculine women together. So do you guys see the connection there? You know, my personal thoughts on it is everyone's relationship looks different. Um, and it's not your relationship to mind your business, period. But, you know, I think everyone has different types of fulfillment that goes into relationships. And I don't think it's about masculine, feminine. It's just more about can this person um, meet the needs that I need in a relationship. You define what your relationship looks like to you, not society. Jasmine, on the other hand, for her too long didn't read, I said, that's just gay. And she actually was the person that like kind of channeled the in the intro, basically just like um, Jasmine said, I'm still very against stud on stud. It's just gay. I mean, for lack of a better term, it just cancels each other out. Like you might as well go be with a guy. Like, I understand that it's still a girl, but as far as mentalities go, I need someone who's a little more submissive than me, not someone who's going to be um right at me all day the same way and so again it's just that societal thing that men have to have the power there needs to be someone who has power there needs to be a dominant and a submissive in a relationship to them there needs to be an equal amount of femininity and masculinity for a relationship to work which is absolutely not true 
Jamie said that personally, the thought of two studs together is just like out of this world, but it really doesn't make sense for me to feel that way because it's two women, it's two lesbians, but still many people criticize it. They think it's nasty when it really shouldn't be. It's just like a stud dating a femme. Or femme dating a stud, because again, take the clothes off, it's still two women. So I want to open that up to you guys. What do you guys think? It's just like she said, it's just something that she can't define. You know, it seems beyond articulation. Like she just doesn't understand it. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? And one thing that she said, which I find really disgusting, but a lot of men actually do feel this, is therefore the black lesbian is not threatening because she is still a woman and therefore able to be controlled and dominated. But black gay men, however, pose a threat not only to the black masculinity, but to the black race in general. <sighs> yeah, and then she goes into this blurb about the black nationalists, which is a whole other movement. Um, it's a lot, but essentially she just talks about it's just a threat to keeping the black race going because if there's two men together, then they can't reproduce. And so we can't keep producing more black people. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. So she begins to end it in saying that on the surface, it's quite ironic and perplexing that these studs are homophobic towards other sexual minorities within their race. However, by adopting protest hypermasculinity's homophobia towards homomasculinity, they are in a way seeking to protect themselves from stigmatization and marginalization because of their own sexual orientation. So studs just want to be accepted and you know they take on these qualities just so that they can reach that level of acceptance again we're in a world that is geared against us as black people and so to be not accepted by society as a whole and then your own community the community that you're supposed to love and call home so i thought that was just pretty interesting just to talk about how studs feel and, and you know the mindset behind it the ideals behind it so yeah that was quite a bit to digest but um, I hope you learned a little bit from it. Please let me know your thoughts about anything that I discussed in the comments below. Thank you again for joining me for another episode of Toxic Mental Tuesday. And I will see you guys on Thursday when we talk about why I like to date masculine women and why it is okay and very different from dating an actual man.